<laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We've got our group back from our first Total Garden webinar. And uh, my name's Susan. I'll be the moderator today. And I work in marketing at JPPA, which is the parent company for Jackson and Perkins, Wayside Gardens, Park Seed, and From Seed to Spoon. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes for others to join. But in the meantime, we do appreciate you all submitting questions when you registered for this event. And um, if you'd like to share in the chat with us um, where you're joining us from, our group is spread out a little bit around the country. So you'll get a nice cross section of different information for different zones. Um, what we're planning on covering today includes growing roses, vegetables, perennials and herbs using organic methods for weed and pest control. Um, we'll include ideas for growing in containers or the landscape and we'll touch on the importance of pollinators and the total garden concept which in our line of thinking is essentially finding the garden outcomes you want and finding the plants that will help you achieve that. Oh, nice. We've got two ends of the country there, Tampa and Bellingham, Washington. Can't get much further apart. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so as we dig in, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So Diane, would you kick us off with introducing yourself? Absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Diane Summers, president of the American Rose Society. Really glad to be here with everyone today chatting about plants and hopefully uh, I can help with some questions about growing roses. Uh, the American Rose Society is a nonprofit organization with a mission that's really focused on the preservation, research, education, and enjoyment of roses. We have over 14,000 members in our organization, we've actually been in existence for over 130 years. Uh, we'd love to help answer any questions that you might have about growing roses. And you can find us on our Facebook page, on Instagram, and of course at our website, rose.org. I live in southeastern Wisconsin. It's a zone five climate. And uh, right now I'm enjoying my garden of over 250 rose bushes in my garden. So uh, I have a lot to learn in these sessions as well about growing other plants and so I look forward to learning just a lot right along with all of you so glad to be here today. Carrie you want to introduce yourself? Yeah yeah hi everybody thank you so much for joining us my name is Carrie um, my husband and I are the creators of Park Seeds app from seed to spoon um, we started growing our own food in our backyard in oh gosh like 2016 or so um and just fell in love with it and the lifestyle and everything associated so we absolutely love growing our own food we do a lot of um, vegetable gardening fruit gardening and then i always add in you know some companion plants some flowers and things like that um we are in zone seven in oklahoma and so right in the center of the country laura will you say hi and tell us about yourself please yeah, hey everyone. Um, my name is Laura Root. I also work for JMP Park Acquisitions, like Susan, and we are Jackson and Perkins Wayside Gardens Park Seeds and Seed to Spoon. I am the senior merchant over live plants and hard goods. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental horticulture from Virginia Tech. Go Hokies! Um, and I don't have a family history of plants and agriculture, like many of my counterparts in school did. Um, so I've definitely learned it very organically and I am the epitome of a chaos gardener. Wes. Hi. Hey, how, how's everyone today? <laughs> Took me a minute to get here, but I'm here. Um, I'm with, uh, JPPA also, I'm the rose category manager and also the merchant for Jackson and Perkins. I've been in and around the rose business all my life and I have a formal horticultural degree or education from Kansas State University way back in the 1940s. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, again, <laughs> thanks everyone for share, sharing where you're joining us from. We've definitely got a good cross section. And, and you know, I think you probably heard when, with those introductions that we're, we've got what zone five, zone seven, zone eight. So a lot of different perspectives. And then, you know, Carrie, I, I feel like you kind of specialize in vegetables. Laura and Wes have a good broad cross section. Diane, of course, the roses. Um, so let's dig in. Let's um, 
share that first slide and we're just going to kind of let things roll. Um, we'll pose some questions. We'd love for you all to ask us questions. We'll follow up on a few that were asked um, with the registrations. So if you have burning gardening questions, please share them. Um, so as we kick this off, what is the total garden? Um, and really the concepts that we'll talk about today are how you can plant things together to make growing the things you love easier. So when we talk about um, the total garden and how a total garden supports plant and soil health, which is one of those time-saving mechanisms, um, Diane and Laura, can you talk more in depth about how that works? Sure, let me kick that off. Um, to me, when you're looking at a variety of plants, you're helping the soil because different plants need different types of soil. And so you've got that nurturing of the plant really helping the soil. Um, as you're using different nutrients at different points in time. And also from a gardening perspective, those different plants are bringing different plants um, into your garden, which of course help the other plants to grow and to thrive as well. Um, so having um, a variety of plants in your garden, I think is one of the, the best opportunities to help your soil, help your plants and to help yourself enjoy that garden. Great. And Laura, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, that was very well said, Diane. Uh, soil structure is super important. Um, I will tell you from my experience, I have done both amending soil and not amending soil. Um, with semi-equal results, just timing is a little different as far as how long it took me to get where the soil is. Um, the more plants you grow, you do have different soil nutrient needs for each of those. Mm -hmm. So that does help the soil structure, but just having all of the root systems going through breaking up clay or hard spots, um, you'll find plants will absorb moisture in some areas and which is helpful if you have standing water in any way or so there's there's so many ways you can talk about soil structure and how it helps uh, having a multitude of plants growing. Well, and, and maybe something that's important to mention too, um, you all may be familiar with these, but every county has an extension office and they are kind of experts in the local, um, what am I trying to say, like local soil, plants that grow well, that kind of thing. So um, look into that and, and use that as a resource. I know um, this group is a fan of having soil tests done um, I'm a fairly new gardener and I haven't done that, but I, I know that I should. Um, when you're talking about soil and those kind of interplanting and, and companion planting, which we'll get into later, um, it's interesting to me because I feel like when you plant something, the plant is taking things from the soil, not necessarily putting things back in. So it's interesting to know that when you have a good mix of plants, that they're all working together to do both of those things, take what they need from the soil and then give some things back. So um, interesting. Um, and again, uh, attendees, people who are watching, please share some questions with us if you'd like. And, and Andrew, if you want to pop up a couple of questions from the audience, please do. Um, Carrie, we could go to the next slide, I think. Um, so, you know, there are a variety of different planting methods, which again, as a new gardener, were kind of new to me and we've listed them here. And with each subsequent slide, we'll dig in a little bit deeper to those. But um, when we talk about these planting methods, Carrie, to me, what comes to mind first are vegetables. Are these concepts that people can use for flowers as well, or is it pretty vegetable specific? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they can use this for any sort of plant. I mean, it can be vegetables, fruit, roses, flowers. I mean, so many plants have benefits for different plants too. So it's not just beneficial for the vegetables. It's beneficial for the fruits and for the roses. There's certain things you can plant to help with pests and things like that as well. Like there's just so many benefits. It's countless. <laughs> Um, will you go to the next one too, please? Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll dig into each of those concepts now, which is why I'm asking her to, to go ahead because each, each of these planting methods delivers something a little bit different, but I think all of them in the end deliver some time savings with gardening, which I think we're all interested in. So um, real quick, should we answer this question that we have from Kimberly about when is the best time to transplant ground cover? 
and then oh, thank you, Andrew. And then we'll get into the companion companion planting concepts. Um, let's see, who should we pick on there? <laughs> Anybody who wants to take it? I'll jump oh. in. Uh, typically, you know, I think of transplant time as two different seasons. Uh, you can do it in the early spring uh, when you have a lot of uh, a good weather uh, to, for growing ahead of you. Uh, and you can also do it once a plant is dormant. So uh, whichever is your choice. The thing you don't want to do is do your transplanting in the late spring when the summer heat is getting ready to come on or do your transplanting in, in the early part of the summer when it's just too hot. Keep in mind where you're located too. So if you're doing it in the fall and you have a very, very short fall and you go right into freezing and and temperature changes like that, keep that in mind too. Yeah, give it a little bit of time to settle in before you get extreme weather for sure. Mm -hmm. And that, um, Wes, when you mentioned when the plant's dormant, that just means that it's not trying to grow deeper but roots. Typically, you, by that I meant uh, the, the winter time. You know, once we've had a couple of frosts, uh, you know, before things start to grow in the spring, but when they're not actively growing, uh, usually in the winter months or early spring months, that's what I was referring to. Okay. Yeah. Almost like a bear in hibernation kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and that works well for roses as well. I, I live in, you know, zone five in Wisconsin, but I have for a number of years been planting bare root roses in the fall, which most people wouldn't think would be appropriate. You'd think about doing that, of course, in the springtime, as Wes said, once the soil, you know, had warmed up a bit. But what I found if I plant them in the early fall, they get themselves acclimated. And then in the spring, I have got my beautiful roses growing already and they're growing at the same pace as all the other plants in my garden. So even for roses, you can certainly plant in the spring or in the fall. And Diane, when you're um, adding winter protection to your roses being in zone five, do you do that for all of your roses or for roses that are kind of skirting those zone, you know, highs and lows? Yeah, you know, um, I am actually doing very little winter protection in my garden at this point. Um, and like I said, I have over 250 roses and I rarely lose a bush. So it depends uh, how roses make it through the winter it depends, number one, on the plant. Many roses today are just very hardy and you'll see that more in the new varieties that they're growing them to be hardy. Um, the second thing is you've planted it appropriately for your climate and you've taken care of it during the summer. So if it's a healthy plant going into fall and winter, um, it's certainly going to be um, have a better chance of getting through colder temperatures. And again, it's going to depend upon your climate zone and what kind of protection that you have to give. Um, you know, I there are some things that maybe are my newest plants or if there's some things that are I know are a bit uh, tender, I might do some covering of them, but um, I don't have to spend a lot of time covering anymore in my garden. And I'm finding all the new things I'm buying are just that kind of hardy plant. But this time of the year, I'll start tying my rose canes together with twine to keep the branches from you know, blowing a lot in the winds. Um, that could damage the plant down at the base of the plant. So that's one thing I'll do. Um, I had such a great growing season this year. My hybrid trees are taller than me. So <laughs> I need to make sure that they'll make it through those winter winds. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it looks like Kimberly has a bit of a follow-up question about the ground cover. Um, the first question was the best time to transplant ground cover. So is this, I'm guessing this is when would you plant seeds for clover as a ground cover? Carrie, can you take that one? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very similar to transplanting. I mean, you you just want to give it some time to establish before you get extreme weather again. So um, the best times, again, we're going to be spring and fall. Um, I would try and do early fall, though, before the weather starts to get too cold. Give it just a little bit of time to establish. Um, let's get into plant selection. And then I see we have a question from Deborah that we'll circle back to as well. Um, so when we talk about companion planting, and we'll follow up with everyone. If we have your email address, we'll send a follow-up email after this with a, a good list of companion plants. But um, can you kind of talk about the concept of what companion planting is and then maybe 
Wes, can you do that? And then Carrie, maybe you could give some examples of, uh, well, and anyone, don't jump in, examples of kind of the most popular or well-known companion plants? Yes, um, you know, the, the concept here is to diversify your planting so that you have different varieties of plants, different species of plants to give you a diverse ecosystem. Uh, horticulture and agriculture get into trouble typically when they go into what uh, they talk about as uh, monocultures, like a field of corn or all maple trees, uh, for example. Uh, that, those problems occur when you get a disease that is, uh, can affect that one species and it uh, can cause damage to the entire crop. If you have a garden that's mixed species, uh, vegetables, flowers, roses, trees and shrubs, then you start to have uh, issues where an insect or disease might uh, affect one plant and not have an effect on the other. So the, 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 the damage is, is a lot less. So you want to diversify that, that planting and it could be any type of diversification with any type of goal you want, whether it's cut flowers or fragrance or beauty or, or fruits or vegetables uh, for the table. So I, w I will say my favorite examples of companion planting are going to be things like basil and marigolds, planting those with tomatoes because they can really help. Um, so basil really helps to both like improve the flavor of tomatoes as well as help with pest control too. It'll, it'll help um, to repel certain pests. And then marigolds do the same. So they help with pest control as well. They can help with um, pest control outside and also like in the soil too. They help against the uh, harmful nematodes. Um, and then also things like bringing in beneficial insects to the garden to help pollinate. So things like that. Um, so those are always my favorite go-tos. I love basil and marigolds and they always like, I literally always plant my tomatoes with them alongside. I, there's like never a summer now that I don't do that. <laughs> Good. That's a great tip. Um, Laura, Diane, do you have any favorites? Um, maybe. I use a lot of basil in both my vegetable planters as well as in my landscape, uh, partially because it's just super easy to germinate and sow. I mean, you throw the seeds down and it comes up everywhere. And I have basil tree trunks like this big around. Um, it brings in a ton of pollinators when you let the flowers go. I typically let the flowers go a lot sooner in the landscape than I do in my vegetable gardens, just because I make pesto and cook with it and don't want necessarily the flowers right away. Um, I've used a lot of nasturtium. Um, I have recently started throwing leftover garlic cloves from like the grocery store or whatever in my landscape. And I'm starting to see little, you know, um, garlic bulbs come up. I'm not eating those typically. Um, I have a separate crop in the, in the garden that I eat, but those have been known to keep away aphids and pests and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of just, you know, like, like I said at the beginning, I'm the epitome of a chaos gardener. Um, you know, I do my best to companion plant when I am thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of the times Laura with those, with the garlic, like what I'll do is I like, I'll, I'll just plant my garlic, like in an outline around the plant that I want to protect. And that actually works really well too. I just have like this, you know, this path of, of garlic protecting my plants. That's awesome. <laughs> I tried that this year. I, this, I've got a whole bunch of garden in my vegetable that I don't, don't really know where I planted it, to be honest, at this point. <laughs> so it'll be a fun game in the spring. Yeah. I'll have to try some basil. I've never thought about putting that near my roses. Um, I do like, I have a lot of allium in my garden for the springtime before my roses really are kicking into bloom cycle. And I also like daffodils. So those kind of take the, you know, give me some color and, and pretty things before my roses start to bloom. You know, fun, fun fact about companion planting and roses. Um, I spent quite a few years in Northern Virginia and Southwestern Virginia in vineyards um, as part of my studies. And they used a lot of 
um, rose plants at the end of vineyards because yep. typically they would show any insect problems or any kind of other problems. So they use companion planting in that notion that it was to, uh, to as an identifier of problems, not necessarily as a solution to any problems. Um, I also saw that in San Francisco and vineyards too. So I just, I think it's very cool that pretty much any plant can be used as a companion in some, in some fashion. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wes, did you have something you wanted to add? Just a little cooking tip. If you'll take that basil at the end of the season left over and put it in your blender with a little olive oil, you can put it into ice trays and freeze those in cubes and have them all winter long, have fresh basil to cook with. Yeah, I have a, I did the same thing, Laura. I have quite a bit of basil and some of it I let go to flour and some I didn't, although I grew all mine in containers. Um, let's grab a couple questions. I see um, Kimberly asked how far back you trim roots. Um, Diana, so, uh, yeah, I, let me help with that. Um, I'm not sure what time of the year that Kimberly may be referring to, but in the fall, I do not prune my roses back. And the reason I don't is, well, I'm kind of a lazy gardener. I have 250 plants. If I prune them back in the fall, I'm going to have to prune them back again in the springtime, right? The other thing is that until, like in my climate at least, until the December time frame, the leaves are helping that plant become um, better preserved for the winter. They almost you know, change the structure, the cell structure, and it change a little bit so that we have like a little bit of antifreeze in it, right? And if you prune that off too soon, you could start the plant, um, Start the plant might start thinking it could be growing again. And at the same time, it's not getting that, that, um, that energy that's helping it to preserve it for winter. Interesting enough, that energy, that structure starts to dissipate in early February. So that's where if you start trying to prune and grow your roses when it's too cold, the antifreeze is now gone, and then you'll have trouble. During the season, I prune back, um, you know, just based upon the shape of the plant, the variety, you know, the type of plant, uh, plant it is. Um, if it's a climber, obviously, that's going to be a little different than a shrub rose, for example, or a hybrid seed. Uh, the basic thing to remember is you will not really damage the rose bush by pruning it too little or too much, unless you, you know, prune it down to the ground. Because I don't winter protect, I do that with many of my plants, but I've got them planted in such a way, it doesn't hurt the plant, come right back. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but a question I have, and Laura, you shared something with me about this this week. Um, rose hips, do all roses get rose hips? No, they no. don't, but a lot of them do. <laughs> um, it was something, Laura had sent something, it was uh, making jam with rose hips, which I hadn't heard of before. So that was I interesting. Yeah. I, I've heard of it. I've never tried it. Um, I've started to play with growing roses from seed. And you do that by collecting those rose hips. Um, not all the rose hips will be fertile and, and will grow into plants, but... It's been kind of fun to do. And if you've ever thought about breeding your own rose, here's a way to at least see if you can grow it. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to see how well I can grow the plants from the seeds. And then um, hopefully in the next year or so, I'll start to create my own crosses. Right now I'm using what, what the bees uh, provide to me when we have those, um, those hips maturing right now. So I have a lot of hips in my garden that I take to collect and then I'm going to try planting them this winter. And you're going to make us some jam and send it to us at the holidays. <laughs> well, I'll, maybe I will. Maybe I'll try some jam too. I have a lot of rose hips in my garden. Yeah, I, I notice them up. I'm in Colorado and I notice them up in the mountains of Colorado, but I've no, never noticed them on my rose plants that I have in the garden. Modern um, breeding is kind of focused away from rose hips. Uh, you know, some of the older uh, varieties, some of the rugosas, uh, hip out more. But uh, it's just been something that's been bred out of some of the modern varieties. Okay, interesting. Um, Carrie, will you go to the next um, slide? And then I just have to have a shout out. We have a, a visitor from Alaska. I would be very curious to know um, how you grow things in Alaska. 
<laughs> All right. I mean, that's not too terribly cold. That's very similar to Minnesota, Wisconsin. Really? Huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, a couple more um, kind of companion planting or planting techniques that you can use to save yourself time in the garden um, are trap or decoy plants. And it's interesting when we were talking about roses and companion planting, I thought about, um, I'm not going to say them correctly, Lori, you'll have to correct me. Um, the type of geranium that you can plant with roses that helps with pests, pelargonium, something like that. Um, but that I think is a trap plant for roses. Um, any specific plant selections you all um, that come to mind for you guys with the trap and decoy plants? Well, nasturtiums, again, I know Laura's mentioned nasturtiums already, but they're known as, as, as a trap plant as well. Um, and they, they'll like actually attract pests to them. So that way it, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it actually makes it so they don't attack the plant that you're trying to protect. Um, also things like sunflowers can be really good trap plants too. Like they, they'll help to bring in certain pests um, and help to take them away from your plants. Maybe you're trying to protect. So if you're trying to protect your veggies or something like that. Okay. Um, we have a question about container gardening and Deborah is asking, um, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> um, how do I get more pollinators to visit the container garden? Um, let's see who wants to take that one. I can touch on it a little bit just because I've had this, I've had this issue. So before owning my own home, you know, I was in apartments and in container gardening throughout college. And, um, and I had the same issue. You would get real good foliage growth on vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, stuff like that. Um, and you would see sunflowers, but you wouldn't really get any fruit. And that's typically because you don't have any pollinators visiting. Um, one thing I would say, if you're heavy into container gardening and you're doing real high end, nice looking stuff, um, do know what you're planting and do the research on the item that you are planting in your containers. Um, many patented plants today are, are not as fragrant as they used to be, or they are not uh, creating the pollen um, that is attracting said pollinators. Um, it's just where, where the industry is right now. Those older varieties are, you know, are, and non patented varieties are also going to be out there drawing in those pollinators. They're going to give you a lot of flowers. They're going to give you a lot of fragrance. They're going to give you a lot of nectar pollen that all your pollinators want. So if they're going to visit, you want to feed them appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, make sure that you are planting not just vegetables, you are planting just flowering annuals and perennials and, and, and be as diversified as you can in your containers. Um, and also remember that your pollinators do need water and they will typically stay away from anything that doesn't have any water or water source close by to them because they have to take it back to their hives. They have to drink it to keep themselves cool. Um, there's a lot that can go into that and don't lose faith. Just keep doing it. They will come. A lot of people have a tendency to just completely clean their garden in the fall and throw away or burn all the debris. And, uh, you know, that's where your pollinators, a lot of them will overwinter. So don't mm -hmm. be afraid to, to allow the canes, especially uh, varieties that have hollow canes or uh, some debris from fallen limbs, or twigs or logs or things in your garden to, to uh, provide a shelter. So they have water, shelter and food. Great. Yeah, that's a good tip about not cleaning up too much in the garden. That's something I learned since, um, you know, joining this group of professional gardeners. Um, I, you know, yeah, just wait till spring, right? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait till spring. <laughs> I was thinking of your right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say too, um, I definitely feel, Deborah, with the limited success with container gardening. Um, whenever we first started container gardening, like we were using like plastic containers and those can be difficult to grow in, um, especially if you don't have any drainage or anything like that. Um, if you haven't tried smart pots before, I would definitely recommend those. They're breathable fabric material. 
super durable. They'll last you for years and they are super easy to use. Um, but they will help to, they will help the roots grow and thrive a lot better. They'll help with the drainage. So you won't have just like a whole bunch of water, you know, in the bottom of the pot. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend doing that because we've had a lot of success with smart pots versus like plastic containers and mm -hmm. pots and things like that. And then with the second part of that question, um, she was wanting to know about reusing the soil year after year in containers. Um, I would say absolutely you can, but just freshen up like compost. So just keep giving it like some fresh, um, either compost or fertilizers, worm casting, you know, so something along those lines just to keep it living. Is um, when you're adding compost to the soil, would you recommend doing that in the fall so that it has all winter to settle in or would you add compost in spring? So I actually do it with each growing season. So whenever I go in and replant something by seed or transplant, I always freshen up the soil in, in the container. So okay. I'm, I'm always adding new compost. Is there any, um, you know, kind of loose rule of thumb if you have a, well, I guess that'd be really difficult to determine. I was going to say like, how much as a percentage of garden soil would you add in compost? So, <laughs> now you're a mathematician. So, well, typically for me, um, my, my container gardening, I do a lot of Mel's mix, which is the square foot gardening technique. So I do a lot of that type of soil making, which is just one third compost, one third of the vermiculite, and then one third of coconut core. So I'm really just adding in like a third of each in equal proportions. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I did, there was a question about squirrels. Andrew, did you catch that one? There you go. It's like magic. Um, <laughs> Bulbs. Who's a who's a bulb expert? I mean, I can take this one too. Um, there's really no way to prevent it. <laughs> there are some things that you can do to help minimize it. There's a lot of bulb cages out there that you can bury your bulbs in. Um, that doesn't mean that the squirrel can't get in there and eat the bulb, but it's gonna keep them from realizing that they can't pull it out and take it away. And typically squirrels are gonna take their food to wherever they're going before they eat it. Um, I have never used them personally. I think they're great inventions though. And I mean, I've seen them all over the place. So I would start there. Um, the bulb cages I think are gonna be the most efficient just because they're really designed with large mesh, so the bulb has room to force its um, leaves up. You could use certain forms of hardware cloth, but you just want to make sure that your bulb foliage can get through that. Great. So one thing I want to mention too, this is always my favorite tip for things like little, like little animals and rodents and things like that that are bothering your garden, is using a, a one of the automated sprinklers. It yeah. is it's really fun and of course it's <laughs> organic because it's just water but you just hook it up to a like a sprinkler or water system and then um, whenever it senses movement in that area it'll suddenly burst some water at it which it, it'll help to scare it off so i always recommend doing something like that too if you're having problems with like squirrels or something in a specific area set up a motion activated sprinkler right there and yeah and see see if that'll help yeah, great. Um, on to the next slide, maybe. And then, um, Andrew, if you want to just keep throwing up questions, it looks like we're getting quite a few good ones. Um, and we've got our Alaska gentleman talking about row covers, I think I saw. Other plants, native roses, bring the pollinators. That's a great tip. Natives are great for bringing in pollinators locally um absolutely yeah yeah um so on our plant selection slide here we have um we're talking about succession sowing which i think is 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 that specific to vegetables that so you have a a crop all season long as you harvest is that the yep 
concept. That's how I use it, at least. I don't mm -hmm. know if, if somebody else uses it in a different way. Let me know. But um, yeah, I mean, I use I do a lot of succession planting for my vegetables um, just so I have different harvests ready at different times. So that way I don't have like a whole bunch of zucchini ready at the same time or a whole bunch of, you know, a certain type of vegetable ready at a certain time. So I just try to plant like maybe one week and then give it a week off and then plant the next week some more. Um, so that way I just have a continual harvest. And, and uh, as to broaden the succession uh, concept into a non uh, edible plant is, you know, select perennials and roses and annuals that have different bloom cycles and be sensitive to that. So as one particular plant is declining, uh, in its bloom cycle, you have something else coming on so that you have color or fragrance all year round, or all, at least all growing season. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, now, when you're succession sowing for vegetables, do you, um, for ex let's use lettuce as an example. So you plant your lettuce seeds in this garden plot, and then you'd be harvesting here, and then maybe adjacent to that, you'd plant more lettuce. You're not planting it in the same place, I guess is my question. Yeah, yeah, I do it in different locations. Um, and it also helpful too, because just in case I get like a pest attack in the other area, I'll, I'll still have some you know lettuce growing over in this area of the garden. So I do it for more more reasons than just having harvest at the same time. So it's like if something happens to, to go on wrong over here, I still have some over here. Yeah, that I think Wes made that, um, you know, kind of one of the basic concepts mm -hmm. of the total garden is um, doing that so that you don't have a, you know, you don't lose everything at once. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I remember when we were talking about this, it might have even been before the last webinar, but um, talking about how important it is to, um, I've just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> oh, well, we'll go on to the next question. I think It'll oh, come I know what it was, it was the, the chaos garden, Laura, you talk a lot about you're throwing it out there and seeing what happens. And, you know, it really is kind of a personal preference, whether or not you want to take that approach or you want to have a really neat garden. You know, it's, I think either one is possible. And I do feel like one of the trends that we're seeing in gardening is really the kind of wildflower gardens and chaos gardens. And I think that's kind of emblematic of, of the amount of time we have available to take care of the garden. And so really it, it's just your personal preference. There's not one right way or one wrong way. Absolutely. It's very much your personal preference. So just focus on what you love. You know, do, you, do you want fragrance? Do you want food to eat? Do you want uh, pollinators or just to have a, a garden that has showing some feature all year round? The, the, the concept here is that we're not focusing on just an individual plant. So whether it succeeds or fails, uh, you know, our garden succeeds or fails. We're in a process where the garden is in essence, built to succeed or fail at any given time based on the uh, growing season of that particular plant. So your success is constant and uh, new things are coming along and you're getting what you want from the garden as opposed to just having a bush in the corner that you trim every spring. Yeah, yeah, good point. You were probably the one that brought that up. <laughs> was in terms of having, you know, growing the way you want to really. And that's, you know, kind of the concept of, of the total garden. And we I have- I think this Perry, you know, summed it up. She, she says she always does a basil with her tomatoes. I said, you know, just that is, uh, you know, your basil will grow and your tomatoes will start to decline. And, you know, you, you'll have an incredible uh, option for enhancing your recipe. Um, so we have this question from Faye and um, about excess compost or soil for this season. And then do you keep some and where do you keep it um, for the next season? So it's almost, does, does compost expire? <laughs> no, it doesn't expire. And thank goodness, if you've got excess, that's great. Uh, you know, compost building, uh, soil building is a constant process. Uh, it's a year round process, although it's, you know, peaks mainly in the, in the warmer seasons. But uh, by all means, keep your soil and keep uh, keep adding to it. 
and keep building that uh, aspect. I don't know that you can ever have too much composted soil. But it wouldn't be necessary to cover it or put it in a protected location. You can just keep it where it is and use it as you need to. Well, you know, the compost works with, with a heat. And so it, it'll be more functioning as you feed it and that heat increases. I, I guess you could put a, a frost heat blanket over it or heat blanket over it. I wouldn't protect it. Um, but in, in my composting process, I don't do anything to protect it from the seasons. Okay. I just have a little tumbler, so there's not, I don't have options there. <laughs> well, I've had stuff over in both bags and when it was bulk delivered. And I mean, sometimes you get a little algae growth, sometimes you get some bugs, but I mean, it's dirt after all. <laughs> <laughs> so it's totally safe to continue to use it. And even in most cases, you're likely just making it the nutrients right. more bioavailable for your plants anyway. So, you know, I think I can speak for many gardeners out there, you know, waste not, want not. Use it, mm -hmm. continue to use it. You'll see the signs if something is, is awry. Um, I do have to say that when, one year I thought I'm going to move this pile of soil <laughs> so it's not like in my driveway for the winter. And I did make the mistake of putting it um, just off the lawn in the woods. And then I used it the next spring and I had so many different weeds growing in my garden that I never saw before <laughs> and that were difficult to get rid of. So um, I, I would be personally more cautious about you know, where you decide to move it to, right? Um, it would have been better if I would have just left it where it was and thinking I was putting it out of That was a little bit of a mistake I had that year. Um, but I definitely, I have some, um, I have some uh, worm uh, castings right now that I haven't put in the soil, and I might use them to help to protect some of my roses, you know. But otherwise, I'm happy. so um, face in a, another note saying she meant more about if the soil or compost was in a bag. So it sounds like just keep it in the bag and. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff in the bag that I have, um, you know, when you get a great deal, you go and buy it, you buy it by the pallet load. So I do have pallets behind my workshop full of organic potting mix and compost. And we just make sure that it's off the ground. My husband puts it on a pallet um, and we hand stack it. And then we put a tarp over it and another pallet on to keep that tarp down. So we do cover it a little bit. It does help, doesn't help keep bugs out, but it does keep it, the bags from breaking down. Um, and we do keep it out of the sun. Great, awesome. Um, Carrie, should we go to the next planting method? There we go. Ah, oh, that we may be to the end of our PowerPoint there, but we have a lot of great questions. Um, if there are some that uh, resonate, Andrew, feel free to throw them up there. Um, I do think we had a great overview of the mixed species and, and the benefits of that, um, which is terrific because it really does illustrate why. Um, you know, maybe you'd go to a botanic garden and there'd be a, a group of this and a group of it over there and, and you know, taking on those strategies that um, will keep things healthy if you do have some kind of a pest infestation or something wrong with the soil. So I think that's really helpful. Let's see what uh, Andrew's got up here. I've heard that I can do this, but I've been afraid to. Back in spring, I planted two marigolds one and a half feet apart that have grown to a half foot wide and nearly three foot feet tall. Can I dig them up and move them to another location in my yard? <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect timing, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, marigolds. Well, I mean, for me, I'm not sure where you're located, but, but for me, they are annuals. So they're not going to survive too much longer in most places. So I personally wouldn't go through the trouble. I would keep them where they are. I mean, that being said, I'm, I don't see a reason why you couldn't dig them up and put them somewhere else. Just make sure that you do get all the roots and you make sure to, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> alarm we're all gonna be getting. <laughs> and you make sure to uh, just uh, transplant them before it gets to be, uh, 
you know, too harsh of conditions and that it gets established. I'm in zone eight and I've, I've seen it done and I've done it. They don't typically fare well though. Yeah. I mean, granted I wasn't growing a specific variety or the, the real, you know, heavily researched varieties. They were just random marigold seeds. Um, they didn't die, but they just, they didn't look so hot towards the end of the season. And by the time frost came around in about December, it was gone. So another um, kind of a personal question here with the annuals, um, it, we were talking about cleaning up and leaving things until spring. Would the same recommendation hold true for annuals that you just let them, you know, kind of go in the garden and then maybe turn them into the soil in the spring or what's the best approach for fall care for annuals? I can touch on this a little bit and it may be backtracking slightly. Um, I think I'm a little bit more picky with annuals because typically they're going to go to like a sludgy mush if they get frost or anything in, um, in that fall, that first fall season. You really don't want to keep anything diseased in your gardens um, and you do want to clean those up. Uh, so I, I would be more careful with annuals than perennials. Okay. Um, you know, we, we didn't talk about this, but I know that sometimes flowers have seed heads that are beneficial for birds in the winter and that kind of thing. Are, do annuals have the same thing? Do annuals have um, seeds or things that would help um, birds or early emerging pollinators, or is that more of a perennial thing? Uh, they can. I think you're going to predominantly see that in a biennial and a perennial, though. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'll, I'll personally say too, like I, I, um, I do like, I will clean up if I want to use that space, like mm -hmm. for fall planting or for my cool season plants, something along those lines. But otherwise, I mean, like we've been talking about, I'm lazy. I'll leave it sitting there and leave it for food for the other animals. Yeah. I, you're freeing up my fall weekends. You guys, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything we can do. All alone. <laughs> ah, cold frames. Um, so I've used cold frames for the past few years, some failure, some success. Any suggestions on utilizing the system better? I have mature brassicas growing and then aphids attacked. Um, cold well, frames. I will say aphids, I mean, if you catch them early enough, you could just spray them off um, wherever you see them and with just a hose. Um, and then I mean, they're so tiny, they just fall to the ground and they can't really reestablish. So that would work, but you have to catch that in time. Um, and of course, I mean, over the winter though, in a cold frame, you can't use ladybugs to your advantage, which is what I always suggest in the summer. Mm -hmm. But um, I would just recommend keeping a, keeping a close eye on them. And if you see an issue, just bring a hose, if it's not frozen, hopefully or maybe like a squirt bottle or something and just spray your areas. And is there any general rule of thumb with a cold frame? Um, you know, for example, if you're, well, let's use zone seven because that's where you, you're growing. Uh, does it extend the season by a month, a week, or I, it probably just depends on the weather, doesn't it? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's variable. Um, for me, I mean, I can pretty much, like if I utilize cold frames, right, I can grow certain things year round here in zone seven. So things like kale, um, some spinaches, like, and they'll come back with a vengeance in the spring, which is great. Um, but things like that, that are like real cool and cold hardy, I can grow all year round with cold frames. Cool. Okay. Good to know. Um, I see a note there that I thought that was the FEMA test when that alarm went off. We were, <laughs> we were talking, you guys, before the call, and we just a normal yeah, alert for the next nine like minutes because everybody's phone's going to go crazy. I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that um, we'll wrap it up. Um, you know, for the attendees, the audience that's here, this is a concept that we hope to continue to talk about. So keep an eye out on social media and in email. Um, for future events about Total Gardens and keep those questions coming if you have them. Um, stash them away, ask them later. Oh, you know, there was one thing that um, 
I saw come through something about asking about a book that talks about time frames for growing. And I feel like my first, you know, gut instinct with that was the From Seed to Spoon app. So let's take just a minute, Carrie, so you can talk a little bit about the Seed to Spoon app and how that can help people. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's available for download in the iOS and Android stores. And there's also a web app version too at app.seedtospoon.net. Um, but it'll help walk you through growing over 100 different fruits, vegetables, herbs, um, flowers also. Um, and there is a QR code right up there that you guys can scan. <laughs> and, um, and it'll take you directly to the download link. Um, but you can go through, it'll give you exact planting dates based on your location. So it'll pull the frost dates, um, the predicted frost dates, and give you estimated planting dates on when you should be able to plant things out in your garden or indoors to get them started. That's probably my favorite thing. But it'll also give you like pest management tips and companion planting. And you can go through and um, chart all of your um, all of your plants so you can keep track of them, like when you planted it. So it'll give you sprouting dates, harvest dates, things like that. So it'll kind of be like your whole garden planner. Great. Yeah. Also, the all of our websites will tell you bloom time as well. So if you want succession blooms in your garden, don't be overwhelmed. Take a look at the stuff that you like and you're drawn to and just look at those bloom times and pick different bloom times for different things. Yeah. Good point, Laura. Yeah. The early spring, late spring, mid, you know, all of that is mm -hmm. are in the plant details. So great. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone for being here. We sure appreciate it. And um, thank you for the questions and your enthusiasm and involvement. And thanks to the panel for all of the expert advice. We'll see you next time. Thank, thank you everybody for joining.